Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Wilcox Farms, which is located between Correctionville and Anthon here in the warmer than warm Northwest Iowa. My name is Becca Clay, and joining me today um, are my PFI colleagues, Emma Little and Jason Tietrich. And then back at the PFI office in Ames, we've also got Megan Sweeney helping us out to run the switchboard. Um, we are here today live from the farm with the Roger Wilcox from Wilcox Farms. Uh, Roger co-owns this with his brother, John. And yesterday, Roger was suggesting that maybe we move this to the pool so we could be nice and relaxed and chilled out. But eventually we decided that, you know, we'd come back to the field and, and really show you guys what, what's going on here. So we're excited to be out in the field roasting so that you can be uh, enjoying from the, the chillness of your own home. Um, so today, Roger and I are going to be showing and talking to you a little bit about the harvest process. We're going to be um, talking about post-harvest handling for small grains as well. Um, we are standing in an oat field, obvious, well it's not obvious, it's obvious to me. Um, <laughs> and uh, we'll be talking about both oats and rye. Um, and then we've also got Roger's seed cleaner out here, so we'll be um, talking a little bit about the seed cleaning process for selling cover crop seed as well. Um, so I'd like to welcome all the viewers who are joining us today. Um, we would love to know where you're calling in from and, and watching from, so feel free to drop your name and your location in the chat box there in the comments. And um, if you've got any questions or you want to share your own experience with uh, harvest and, and post-harvest handling of small grains, we'd love for you to drop those in and we'll slowly work those into the conversation as we see fit. So, um, Roger. Uh, I would love for you to, you know, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about, you know, your family, your farm, um, and extended rotations, what got you into this, and you, you run a couple of businesses as well, so tell us about those. Okay, Roger Wilcox again, and uh, we farm primarily corn and soybeans. We do also some small grains, alfalfa, uh, some grasses for feed, and we uh, been into small grains, growing them for harvesting for probably seven or eight years. We got into cover crops about 12 years ago and that kind of got our interest into growing our own for grain and for seed. But, uh, you know, we've been, my family homesteaded here, so we've been here since 1867. And my grandfather, he kind of started the conservation effort in his time by farming on the contour. It used to be that people would just farm straight up and down the hills and he was kind of one of the first to farm on the contour and put terraces in. And then uh, the next generation, my father, he got into no-till and uh, my brother and I that farmed together, we kind of picked up the torch, took no-till no a little bit further and now we're, we've added cover crops to that. So that's kind of, um, how it's progressed on our farm. But uh, in our region here, in our area, it's really uncommon at this time to grow small grains. Uh, back, you know, 70 years ago, it was fairly common for people to be diversified. And over time, the markets kind of uh, converged on corn and soybeans for our area um, for a couple of reasons, because of, you know, where the markets are and then Sometimes our weather is not totally conducive to small grains. And there's other areas that, you know, it works a little bit better and sometimes our yields can be better. But we've been fairly, we feel fairly successful at, at growing small grains. And again, this is an oat field here. And there's a couple of reasons we, we put this oat field in. Uh, you know, we wanted to do some small grains and get some diversity, but also there's a couple of erosion problems here. And we wanted to get ahead of the normal harvest window of corn and soybeans and be able to come in here and do some dirt work. So we're going to put in some terraces and do try to fix some ditches that were existing here when we started farming. So there's, like I said, a couple reasons why we're doing that, why we're growing small grains here. Uh, this year we've also grew rye and uh, we just harvested this field about three days ago and the rye was uh, about 10 days ago. And of course the rye was planted in the fall and this oat field was planted in March. We try to get in the field as soon as it's fit in the spring. And we do that to try to beat the heat and we get a better test weight. Uh, one of the things that they grade for in small grains. So the earlier you get in, the more you get ahead of the heat for grain fill. So that's why we planted it that early. Um, 
So Roger, why don't you tell us a little bit more about kind of your oats and where it fits into your rotation here. Um, you said, one thing I've heard you say before is five crops in three years. So tell us a little bit about your rotation. Yeah, so there's a couple of things with that. Um, you can, when you do small grains, you can really cram a lot of different, a lot of diversity into a short window. And so you can, for instance, you can do corn and maybe do a rye cover crop after that, come in with soybeans, harvest your soybeans, go back into rye, harvest that rye the next season in the summer. And then what we did last year is we put in a dwarf sorghum sedan, we baled that for feed. And then we came in after that even and put a, another brassica cover crop and oat mix into that and baled that for feed and then let the brassicas grow back and also we grazed it, let the cattle graze it. So there in, a, in three years, you've had at least five rotations and a lot of diversity. So that's how small grains really fits in well. And another thing that's, I hear a lot of people, myself included, say, you know, I wish we had another rotation. If we really had another rotation, that would help out with weeds, diversity, whatnot, kind of spread things out. So it is possible in our area, we think it's not, but it is possible, for instance, the oats that we, grew here, we took 25 miles away and sold them at an elevator in Sioux City. So, um, and I figured out the profitability for both the rye and the oats was, uh, after all costs, is around a little bit over $200 an acre profit. Now, this year might not, depending on what happens with the weather here on now, it might not compare, be, you know, corn might be better, but still it is profitable and you can work it into your rotation if you want to. And every year obviously is gonna be different, but we're talking about yields. Uh, it was obviously dry this year here, but we got, on this field, we're predicting around 120 bushels an acre. Um, we don't know yet because we haven't taken it all in and scaled it, but uh, we, we feel like that's about where we're gonna be. The rye was not very good this year because when it filled, it was very dry and we ended up around 35 bushel an acre. Normally we're low 50s for that. And so the, the seed here, this went to market. This is a, um, not a public variety. We can't keep it for seed, so this went to be used for feed. The rye is a public variety. We normally save some of that back, and then we, we use that for sowing you know, future cover crops. Okay. Emma, do you want to zoom in on, we can take a look at the weed pressure here. Roger mentioned that you guys didn't do any sort of herbicide applications in the oats this year. Is that correct? So just... All right. Normally we, we don't have hardly any weed pressure. This year we did have a little because once it was established, it turned off cool and damp and it didn't grow for a long time and allowed the weeds to come through. So there were some weeds here. Normally, if you get a good seeding, this is two bushels per acre, but if you get good coverage, and this is, you can see I double seeded it to get better coverage, uh, normally you wouldn't get that weed pressure. But if you do, it's fairly simple and inexpensive to take care of. But we, we did not spray this with a fungicide or a herbicide at all. And that's really, another benefit I see about it is if you can get away from one rotation of herbicide even, I feel like that's a benefit also. Totally, maybe not seeing as much, um, I guess, uh, populations of herbicide resistant. Um, yeah, exactly. If, if you don't give it a chance to become resistant. Perfect. And a little bit more background, like Becca mentioned earlier, uh, we do, we own a seed business for uh, corn and soybeans, but also we own a seed business for cover crops. And the way we kind of worked ourselves into that was we wanted a drill because we had been aerially applying and not getting the best results every year. So we wanted to get a drill and we couldn't afford it by ourselves. So we went together and there's four of us on the drill together. And then we went one step further and we started offering the drilling service to people. And we also offered seed for sale to people. So there's four of us that are involved in that. And that's another thing that's worth mentioning if you want to get into small grains or cover crops, it's really good to have a good support team, someone that kind of thinks the same way you do, that you can bounce ideas back and forth, share equipment and whatnot, because if you're doing just a small portion, it is a different set of equipment that you need to be able to do this. If you only do corn and beans, you're not going to have some of this other stuff. So if you can get in a situation where you can share some of that, that's really beneficial too and helps out the bottom line. 
Perfect. So maybe let's kind of get into the meat and potatoes of what we're talking about today with harvest. So for this oat field, tell us about, you know, what sort of conditions you were looking for so, with harvest. Yeah, so basically we, talking about equipment again, we take the we take the uh, oats standing, we don't windrow it. You can windrow it and basically the oat head could usually is ready before the straw is ready. The straw will still have a lot of green or if you have weeds, the weeds won't go through the combine efficiently. So it has been common practice just to, uh, to put it in a windrow, let it dry and then pick it up with your combine and harvest it. But then to do that, you need a windrower to hire a windrower and then you need a special pickup head for your combine, which we don't have, so we elect to take it standing. And we, we have a, we took this with a draper head, um, you know, which obviously feeds it a lot nicer than a, a auger table, table head would, but took it with a draper head, it's 40 feet wide. Um, we don't go terribly slow, but it'd be a little bit slower than normal because of the green. And we're using the John Deere um, combine, the newer series. And for small grains, really the older series would be what would work best. Um, this straw will be baled to be sold for bedding. And it goes through the rotor in the newer series combine and it tends to chew it up a little bit more than the older ones would. But we take the chopper out of the combine, we back it out and then just drop it on the ground. So it doesn't go through the chopper, but it does go through the rotor, which chews it up. But if you did have an older series, a uh, non-rotor combine would be ideal. The walker combines are really the best for small grains and cleaning it and uh, leaving nice straw on the ground to bale. Uh, but we, what we basically looking for, right, is we want the, the grains to be dry enough. And this year that wasn't really a problem, but you just look for easy shelling and if you pull on that, they'll just, they'll fall off. So that's what we look for is the, the easy shelling and dry because they need the grain to be, in our instance, you know, under 13%, and that if you can take it under 13 and avoid drying it in a grain bin, it's a lot less work, basically. So that's kind of the same for the rye. You know, we're looking for, basically, can we get it through a combine and is it dry enough? And that brings up another good point. So we save back some rye for seed. And what we normally do is we put it in wagons, and then we do have a, there's a, really old-fashioned aeration system where you turn in a, a tube and then put a little fan on top. So we just put it in our wagon and if it's too wet or too hot, we'll turn that tube into the grain, put a fan on top and run that for a week or so. And it would be really something that's inexpensive if anyone's interested in that and, and buying one of those, you'd probably get one at a sale for about nothing. So. But that's, you know, you could put it in a grain bin, but we really don't have enough to make a grain bin, you know, viable. It'd be a lot of work for not a little, just a little bit of grain, basically, to, to get it dried down. And after that, the oats, they can go straight to market because we're not gonna seed them again, but then the rye will clean it if it's gonna go through a drill. Now, a lot of times we'll just put it through a spreader because um, we've had good results with frost seeding in a spreader and put it in the fertilizer spreader, it doesn't matter if there's some sticks in it or if it's a little bit dirty. And that's another inexpensive way if you want to get into using your own cover crop and if you don't want to get a grain cleaner or don't have access to one, you can put it through a spreader and get pretty good results. We've done that a lot in January where we go out and spread on the frozen ground and it, it comes up pretty decent in the spring. Great, so can you tell us a little bit more about the, for oats specifically, the specs that the elevator is looking for when you're selling and are you doing anything special with your combine settings to get to those specs or is it just kind of? Yeah, so this, where we take it, the, the elevator wants them to be 36 pounds per bushel or above and there's a, a docking scale if it's below and then under 13%. So there are different things you can do, like a lot of times uh, people would set their fan a little bit heavier on the combine to blow the, low, the light oats out the back. Um, we didn't do that. If you look around on the ground, you won't find much, but to back up a little bit and what we did before is the, these do have um, nitrogen on them. 
and we have a pretty good history of putting manure on this field so I think that probably helped us out a little bit on the test weight. The other thing is we try to, this is a, a northeast slope, so we try to position the oats where the soil is not going to get as hot maybe during the day and you know you'll save a couple degrees and maybe it will give you a little bit better fill. And then the other thing is cleanliness, you know, but um, most combines can do a pretty good job. What we do, we run a standard concave on our combine for corn and beans. We do have small grain, but we don't put that in. We put in filler plates because the standard combine uh, concaves for corn are pretty wide openings. And that just holds the grain in a little bit longer and threshes it against itself. So there's a plate that holds the grain in, doesn't let it through the grates. And then pretty much it's a similar setting to combining soybeans. Uh, the fan speed that we use on this was 800. And uh, 5 and 12 on the chaffer and sieve, but uh, you know, that's going to be depend on your combine, what your settings are. But it's basically, it's okay if you see some on the ground, right? If you throw a bushel or two out, of, out on the ground and they're lighter, it might help you when you go to market it. Another thing is those oats are probably going to grow, and we typically see that. You know, we, you've combined early enough in the year, if you get some rain, there's going to be some seed on the ground and it's going to grow, which is a, we think it's a good thing. So you get to kind of a seeded cover crop that way. All right, so maybe we can move to talking a little bit about seed cleaning. Like Roger said, um, he's got old 20 ag supply, which remind us again what services and products you guys yeah, are so supplying. Old 20 ag supply, that's uh, the company where we share the drill. So we will drill, we do a lot of uh, after, drill a lot after uh, chopping or people want to cover crop in the fall. And then we also sell seed and we can, we have access to whatever you would need for cover crops or small grains. So do we want to walk to the seed yeah. cleaner? Let's go check it out. So this is a, a seed cleaner that Old 20 Egg Supply bought to be able to clean rye primarily and oats. And if you look, there's all kinds of different seed cleaners and you know there's some that would still be viable that are 100 years old on a small scale. But the reason we chose this is that capacity is a little bit higher than a lot of the models. Like on oats, you can get 175 bushels an hour through this. On uh, rye, perhaps you could get a little bit more. But the, the way this works is uh, this auger takes the grain from your wagon into the hopper on the top. You have basically a pre-cleaner screen. There's different screens that slide in here. And this is an old machine, but they still make screens and parts. It comes out of Michigan and everything's available. So the first screen basically just gets the, the big stuff off that you don't want. And then it falls down and, and further separates the uh, grain from what you don't want. And then the third step would be to get rid of the weed seed. So there's a small screen in the bottom and that gets rid of your s small seed um, weeds if you would have that. Uh, for instance, this did have some weeds in it, but nothing was seeded yet. So the risk of that being in our sample wasn't really there this year. And then it goes through a fan and uh, it blows out your what's lighter. You could set it to blow out the light seed, you know, if you wanted the higher quality seed, but also the shaft that's in it. It blows out the back. And then it has an elevator and a scale on the back, so then it elevates into whatever wagon or com container that you're putting it in. But these, these get pretty spendy, even though this is old and needs a little work. This was around $10,000 if it was, great condition it would be probably uh, thirty thousand dollars and if it was new you could get up around fifty sixty thousand dollars but there's also same idea on a much smaller scale that's still viable it just would be a slower process so if you did want to clean your own seed to put through a drill it's very possible to pick up, pick one up on a sale for not much money so there's different they're basically different scales of throughput for seed cleaners 
but we wanted to be able to, to clean our own rye. I think part of uh, making cover crops more viable and accessible is if farmers could grow their own seed and clean it themselves and reuse it. So that's what we want to do and that's why we bought this. So. so if somebody in the area were growing their own rye crop or oat crop and they wanted to clean seed, is that something that Old 20 Ag Supply would? Yeah, certainly. If someone wanted to bring some seed to us, we have multiple screens and uh, we could clean it for them. And it looks like you've got it set up here in a trailer so you can just take, do you typically do it out in the field or? Well, the, yeah, the reason this is on a trailer is it come out of Nebraska, but every county in Nebraska had these and would take them to farms and their, I think their primary goal was to help eliminate the weeds from the seed and kind of control the weeds that were getting replanted. And that's why it's on a trailer, but it makes it you know pretty handy that we can set it up anywhere. A lot of them won't be on a trailer, but this makes it handy where you could take it somewhere and set it up. And right now it's all self-contained, has a couple motors on the back and it, you wouldn't need anything else or plug it in actually at all to, to make it work, so. Great, is there anything else that you wanna share about the seed cleaning process or maybe we could talk a little bit about um, the storage? Of... Yeah, so storage, like sometimes uh, the small grains will go through a sweat and you kinda have to watch that if it's in your wagon, you don't want it to heat up. And that kinda gets back to the aeration, like I said before. Um, you know, back in the old days, they might jump in there, scoop it or spread it out on a floor somewhere. And, and kind of just mix it up every day. So there's a lot of different things you could do. You could throw it in a small grain bin and, and blow it around, but it's just something that you have to watch for. And, uh, you know, make sure, you're, like, like any grain, it stays in condition, so. Great, so, and you guys have, what, three or four different options for when you sell seed to customers. Can you talk a little bit about kind of the pros and cons of these smaller bags versus um, your hard-sided um, yeah, so you could, you could get it in a 45 unit bushel bag, a bulk bag we call it, or you can get it, you know, you could get it in a bushel bag or bushel and a half bag, or you can take it bulk, you know, any, basically those are the options that you'd have and just kind of what the person needs. If you're going to fill a large drill, then you're going to want the big bags, and if you're working on a smaller piece or smaller um, drill or you just don't want any more than you need then you take it in a little bag and then we've had put it in semi loads before too and taken it to airplanes so you could you know put it in a do it bulk and have it in a semi trailer and and uh, use it that way Excellent. <clears throat> okay is there anything else that you want to talk about with seed cleaning and seed storage uh, Otherwise, we could talk a little bit more about, you know, okay, you've harvested your oats, you're gonna uh, rake this hay again one more time, and you said that you're gonna bale it again. Um, so what, what's your cover crop plan after this? What sort of, you said terraces, and then what are you gonna do with your cover crop after Yeah, so this? we're gonna, a lot of years you don't have to rake it, but this year it was kinda humid, and uh, the, the rye was really rank, so we had to turn it over to get it to dry. We'll come in and round bale it for uh, bedding. And then after that, we'll, uh, you know, it's early enough in the year where you can get a lot of benefit from multi-species blend. So we'll come in with some brassicas and probably the next rotation for this field will be uh, um, soybeans. So we'll probably come in with rye and some brassicas. And the brassicas, you know, will do great until they get frosted off and then the rye will take over and then in the spring the rye will be here and we'll plant no-till directly into that rye. Um, we'll plant the soybeans and then kill it. But that's another good thing about small grains is that because if you're looking at corn and soybeans, are you going to harvest in October, November, how much the window's so short to get a benefit out of a lot of the different species. But with the small grains, now you can come back in and put a cover crop on. The other thing I mentioned earlier is you could come back in if you're into livestock, you come back in with the sorghum sedan grass and uh, probably pull you know a couple bales per acre off still and then put another cover after that so when that's done. So that would be for cattle guys maybe another option that they could do. You could come back in and still bale more off of this and fit another cover crop in. So there's a lot of options. But we'll we'll probably um, choose to just put a 
cover crop here and, and leave it and not bale it. Okay. And what about, um, you talked about, you know, grazing the cover crop. Is that something that you've ever worked with your neighbors on? I saw a little bit of fencing around here, but not a ton. Have you guys ever done grazing yeah, cover crops so with neighbors? To me, really, the, the ultimate would be, you know, if you're talking about uh, soil health, the ultimate thing would be you're going to no-till, you're going to use cover crops, and you're going to use diversity, and you're going to graze. Because I think, really, the piece that most people are missing is the grazing part of it. And we're fortunate in this area, we still have some fences. A lot of areas don't have fences anymore, but obviously you can put up temporary fences, but it's uh, a really good program to, to bring cattle in and let them walk around and eat your cover crop and you know get the manure and the urine and, and every, all the benefits from that. And we've done that in the past. And uh, we, do, we do have people, I personally sold my uh, cow herd, but we do have people that we work with on certain fields where they bring their cows in, graze the stocks, and it's always nice to have a cover crop area in that field also where they can, uh, the cows can graze on that. But um, just a, an example, two years ago when I had my cattle, I only fed two round bales for the whole winter, and the reason for that is they had the stocks but primarily it was because we had a beautiful cover crop stand of rye and radishes and turnips and they spent most of their days on that cover crop and it saved you know saved an immense amount of feed and effort and labor and machinery just by letting them you know graze and eat themselves versus trying to haul to them and obviously hay is very expensive and and the other benefit is you're getting, you know, like I said, a lot of manure on that ground and enzymes and whatnot. So, yeah, it's a good point. Grazing is really, I think, the missing, the missing piece of the puzzle. And if you have a neighbor that has cattle, if you can work with them on it, it'd be, you know, beneficial for your soil. Great. Um, do you know, we can go sit down. We're pretty warm out here, so we're going to go sit down. But I encourage everyone to pop some questions into the comment box here. We've still got a few minutes, 15 minutes or so. So um, feel free to join us, chime in with any thoughts that you have. We'd love to bounce those ideas off of Roger, but we are gonna um, move to the chairs for just a moment. I guess, Roger, one other question I kind of, Old 20 Ax Supply does a lot with um, you know, cover crop recommendations in general. Um, that's something that you guys provide um, along with the seeds and services. But before we, I wanna uh, ask you a couple questions about cover crops for Northwest Iowans, because people just say it doesn't work up here and I'd love to get your thoughts on that. But one thing that you mentioned earlier was, um, I forgot the term that you used, but you're planting in multiple directions. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about why you do that? And does it cause any issues when you come to harvest or and Emma you could zoom in on this too again you can kind of see you know we've got rows going in in this direction and maybe 30 30 degrees um, from that we've got rows going in the other direction so tell us a little bit more about why you're planting at these multiple angles so the, the reason I did that is because I it's not a great big field it's 30 some acres but what I one, it is uh, no skips, basically, because usually when you get a skip, then that, the weeds will come through. So my goal was to uh, not have any blanks, to, to not have driven. We did this with GPS, but you know sometimes it's still in the hills will drive wide, and then sometimes, uh, depending on, I mean, maybe the newest drills are awesome, but the, anything that has a little bit of age to it, sometimes they'll plug and you won't know it. And so the reason that I double seeded it was just to get a really good stand and to get an even stand and to try to keep the weeds out of it. And it uh, doesn't really, we harvest it in any direction because we're just doing it with a cutting table, the draper head. So it doesn't really matter what direction you go. And so that part of it doesn't matter. And the other thing maybe is to get a little bit, you know, if, Sometimes you're up and down the hill, and if you can uh, get more on the contour, you know, it, usually the drill it doesn't go too deep. It's not a big deal, but 
Sometimes it helps to go on the contour and to keep it from washing out also. So that's that's the reason why it's double seeded. If you if you had a big field or a small drill, you probably don't want to mess around with that, but our drill, you know, it only took me another hour and I had it seeded in the other direction. So or if you you know, if you had to rent the drill, maybe you don't want to put twice the acres on it. So it's not a mandatory thing, it's just kind of a something I wanted to do to maybe get a little bit better result. Perfect. Thanks for the explanation on that again. <laughs> um, I don't know, do you have any other thoughts on just extended I, rotations in general that you'd like to? Yeah, I just want to come back to the, you know, people talk about, well, we wish we had a, another crop. And I think if you, you know, depend on the scale of your farm too, and, and maybe, maybe you can't make it so it's a significant portion of your acres and maybe it's not worth your time because at some point, like with the straw, maybe you're gonna saturate your local market and have to go look elsewhere. But I think that it's kind of a misnomer to say that you don't have access to another rotation because um, last year we grew winter wheat and that's not really native here. And there's some people just to the south of us that grow quite a bit of winter wheat. So it is possible if you go out and seek out the markets or if you have, you know, um, there's quite a premium between us taking these oats to the elevator versus selling them for seed or for feed. If you had access to someone that needs them for feed, maybe a neighbor or whatnot, you know, there would be some premium in that. So, uh, you know, I really feel that if, if you want that rotation bad enough that you could probably, you could fit it in. Um, we're just, like I said, used to corn and soybeans in this area. And, it's probably, you know, the easiest thing to do, but if you're looking for diversity or if you're looking for maybe getting your cover, cover crop established earlier and uh, getting some animals on it to graze, you know, the, it, the possibilities are there if you seek them out. I think that, and the other thing I'd touch on is, like anything in life, if you have a good support group, that's really beneficial, so if you have kind of seek out people, maybe some neighbors, or there's some good uh, discussion groups online. If you have questions, it's always good to have people that are like-minded or want, to, you know, seeking the same goals and bounce ideas off of that and, you know, feed each other back and forth and have someone that's supportive of you. That's really a benefit too. And that's kind of how we got this old 20 egg supply business going was to, you know, have four of us that had the same interest and uh, the same goals and kind of, you know, talked about it a lot and whatnot and, and saw the saw the answers and that's really beneficial if you can get someone that supports you and your efforts, so. Excellent. Yeah, you guys have gone above and beyond with, you know, cultivating that community that's supporting you and ultimately maybe turning into customers, but um, tell us a little bit about the winter wheat as well. You mentioned that in passing, but you're doing oats and rye this year. Um, what was your market for winter wheat last year? Yeah, so we, we did winter wheat just because we wanted to try it, right? It's just something different and uh, very similar to rye, actually. You plant it in the fall, winter wheat, plant it in the fall, and then harvest it in the summer about this time. And it, um, I think it went well over 100 bushel also. So it, it's pretty similar to rye and uh, it ended up going down to Council Bluffs, which is quite a drive away, but it's still a profitable adventure. Um, we did get a good yield on it. And the price, you know, prices are fairly decent right now. So it is something different that we wanted to try. And we were able to, after the winter wheat, we came back in with a brassica and oat mix. And then we ended up, the, the oats actually headed out and we uh, bailed those, bailed the oats for, uh, oat hay with the brassicas in it and sold those bales and then uh, had cattle graze it after that even. So that's a, another viable option that, that you could have in Northwest Iowa. And I, people used to do this stuff 70 years ago. They used to grow all kinds of small grains in this area. So it's possible, you know, again, maybe the economics aren't quite as good as corn, but it also depends on, you know, what your goals are because we're assuming this is, you know, maybe one of our farms that needs a little bit more help. We're assuming that now that we've had this rotation in, that we're going to get a better yield on the next time we plant beans and the next time we plant corn. So you have to, it's not just the one, a one year deal. We're getting better soil structure and we're probably going to get a little bit better yield on the 
crops that come after it. So that also plays into the decision making. It's not just a short term deal. Totally. That's a good point. There's definitely been some research from our universities coming out on that that's showing that there's greater yield stability with these extended rotations and long term greater profitability. I think that's going to be important. So I had a malfunction on my phone here and I'm just seeing um, some of the questions uh, here now. So I apologize that I wasn't asking those earlier, but GR would like to know um, Roger's opinion on optimal moisture for um, for harvest to maintain higher germination for your cover crop seed. So for the oats, he said that you're just kind of looking for it to peel off easily, but what kind of moistures are you looking for, for um, if you're gonna use it as cover crop seed? Well, I'm probably not the expert on that, but I would I would say that you're gonna, you know, want it to be in that 13 window because 13%, you want it to keep and you don't, definitely don't want it to be too dry. Um, like with soybeans, you know, you'd probably want it 14 to, 15% moisture and you know I think it's it's a good question and I'm not the expert but I'm assuming that if you had it in that 13 range that would be probably should be close to optimal but that's something that I'm not the expert on. I also don't know off the top of my head but um, I guess we've got another question on um, clean uh, seed cleaning and cover crop seed so Nick uh, from central Iowa is wondering what's the clean seed percentage that you're getting or what's the percent of clean seed that you're getting from the cleaner so like how much um dirty stuff are you taking off chaff or or inert stuff yeah it, it really depends on the year and and probably um i mean the, the worst thing would be to have weed seed in it and it's probably pretty difficult to always avoid that if, you know if you look at your tags but like this year nothing was seeded yet and so the, you know, the chances of having that sort of thing in your sample are pretty low. But then on the other side of this cleaner, I mean, it's specifically, it's made to eliminate that. So if the question's about how much weed seed they're gonna have in your sample once it goes through the cleaner, it's kind of a function of, of the weather and what you had for weeds and then also what your seed cleaner is gonna do to, for you. And not all seed cleaners are set up this way. They don't all have three screens. Some probably only have two, but that's really the purpose of why people are using this particular one is to eliminate that. So off the top of my head, I mean, it'd be pretty, it'd be, you know, really low percentage if there was any in there. This year, I feel like there would be pretty low chance of having anything, but the comes back to how well you handle your seed through the cleaner, you know? Ideally, you should be able to get almost all of it out. It should be high 99% tile, you know, of of uh, clean seed. That's pretty good. I've heard a few other people from Central Iowa saying closer to 95, 93% for rye. That's coming out, but I'm, this looks like a pretty clean field to me, so I'm not surprised that you're not um, yeah, getting it, a ton of it. And it's a, it's a function of, you know, how well did you clean out your drill and all that because when you're doing multiple, multiple um, small grains, even when you think you got your drill cleaned out, sometimes you'll find other seed in there. So, like for instance, in our wheat field, there was rye, and that's be, is almost impossible, probably impossible to clean that out. So in that instance, there would have been a percentage that was contaminated, and so it's you know a lot of it's a function of uh, if, if you're cleaning out well and. It can be just, you think you got your hopper cleaned out, it can be um, seed that's laying on top of your machine that you spilled and that's, you can, it'll come up and, and it, you know, it's ready to harvest at the same time. So it's kind of a function of how you handle your field and you know, what your weed pressure is and then your cleaner. So it's, it, I'd say it's variable, but it should be really high nineties for sure. Awesome. All right, Roger, we've got a few more questions for you about um, seed storage. So what, um, how do you charge differently for a small bag versus bulk? Um, when you're selling for cover crop seed, is there a big price difference in volume there? Uh, it depends on the year, but I like a lot of times if it's a small uh, lot, the, the bags will be a dollar a bushel more, the small bags will be a dollar a bushel more. 
And it, you know, it's just obviously because of the extra processing time and the extra materials and the handling, it's just easier to handle bulk. So it's usually like a dollar more um, per bushel to handle it in smaller bags. Okay. Is there more to that question? Or yeah, there, there was um, somebody else asked um, not as much about prices, but how are you, you kind of already talked about this, but how are you storing the seed that you're selling to customers? Is it bulk or? Yeah, things? so I mean, a lot of different ways you could do it, but as far as uh, selling to customers, you know, if it's a small quantity and you have the wagon capacity, you could go into a wagon and then and go directly out of that into your cleaner and into the bags. If it's bulk, it could be in a small grain bin. And like, if you're doing it for yourself and there's still some wood cribs around that are viable and that's what we did because the small, that's what the, these wood cribs were made for, you know, 70, 100 years ago was small grains because they had the diversity here. and. So we store our personal rye goes into a wood crib because of the, um, it stores so nice in there because the wood soaks up any extra moisture. So you can store it in there for a long time. But to answer the question, if we were gonna do a bulk for someone, you know, and it was a um, higher quantity, it would go into a grain okay. bin. Okay, sounds good. And then we've got a few more questions about production in general. So let's start with your oats. Um, how much nitrogen did you put down and then what varieties and what kind of yes. uh, test weights did you have? So these are Hayden oats and uh, for nitrogen what we did was as you can see in the background there's corn back here. So this was uh, fall anhydrous and it was about 130 pounds because when we come to the corn we'll add just a little bit more but we weren't quite sure where our lines were going to be, what we we're going to do, so we just did the whole field the same. So 130 pounds of nitrogen. And then most every, this has had both chicken litter and cattle litter, and the last it had was cattle litter, so I don't really manure, I don't really credit any nitrogen there. But it was just a five ton spread of, of manure. And our test weight this year, which is our personal best, was 38 pounds. Uh, I think last year we were closer to 34 or maybe a little bit less than that. And sometimes in Iowa, because it gets hot at the wrong time or you might get disease pressure because of the humidity, it's not as arid here as it would be in some of the plain states, that will take your test weight lower. But the hay notes, um, we've done two years of those and they've yielded really well for us. It's a shorter variety and you know, and it's like any hybrid, it's, it's bred up for yielding well and not falling over. Perfect. And then Lydia was also asking about um, your rye variety. Can you tell tell us what you're growing this year and then have you experimented with different rye varieties in the past? Yeah, we, we've we experimented. Um, I think it's, it's just rye and rye is what we had last year. But now they do offer um, hybrid rye, but you can't save that. It's like uh, just like soybeans or corn. You can't save that for seed. Uh, but you can use it for feed or you could bale it or whatever. So we, we grew hybrid rye and it's supposed to be a shorter rye. And a lot of the the modern ryes are short. You know, we think of rye, like when we first started growing rye, it was six feet tall. But, you know, every year it seems like it's it's not that tall anymore and the spread to be lower so it doesn't fall down. But um, uh, we, like I said, we experimented with the hybrid rye and Basically, you're supposed to get a better yield, and and what we did was we just bailed it and we went and planted soybeans after it because we didn't know what our market was going to be. But if you had a market for it, it's going to yield way better. Like I said before, our yield was 35, and before you know it's in the 50s. This is supposed to get you closer to something like wheat. So we have messed around with different varieties a little bit just to kind of see what they would do. But in the end, for cover crops, any public variety really does the job for you. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention too is we've grown oats, like last year we had a field of anhydrous oats, they did 150 bushel and we had a, two fields where we did, didn't do anything and they, had a, they, they were 100 bushel. So we figured that the, adding the anhydrous or nitrogen you know, paid for itself, but just to compare, there's quite a big difference in the two. Yeah, absolutely. 
PFI's done a little bit of research on nitrogen rates in oats too, so be sure to check out our website on uh, nitrogen rates in oats so you can see how that would affect yield. And it sounds like Roger's been doing a little bit of experimentation himself, but we are um, just about at time here. So Roger, I wanna thank you again for hosting us on this very warm day and showing us around your farm. I don't know, do you have um, any closing thoughts or any words for an, uh, our audience? Oh, not really. I just if anyone has questions, I guess they could ask me also, or you know, ask other people too. Definitely, I'm not the I'm not saying I'm the expert. Just the expert in this area because nobody else does it really. So, <laughs> well, somebody's got to be the first. There's got to be people that are way smarter than I am at doing this stuff. But you know, just in this area, we're kind of the only ones that are doing it. So we like to help people if, if we feel we can, or if we can't, we'll try to get them someone that can so yeah absolutely you guys have a good they have a really great community so um, feel free to reach out to old 20 ag supply I think they're on Facebook you can like them and message them they'll respond back um, otherwise I just want to say thank you to our viewers for tuning in we really appreciated you spending the time with us tonight and I would invite everyone to fill out the evaluations so that we can get your feedback on the event um, and hopefully improve our programming in the future and finally a field day isn't a field day unless we have a little plug for pfi um, so pfi is a, a farmer-led nonprofit based out of ames iowa and we specialize in farmer-led programming such as what you saw tonight we also do quite a bit of um, farmer to farmer knowledge sharing um, events like this and, and quite a bit of farmer-led research so um, we invite you to check out our resources at practicalfarmers.org. Um, otherwise, we'll be hosting another Live from the Farm next Tuesday in Iowa City. Um, so be sure to check that out. It's going to be all about agritourism and how to incorporate that on your farm. But um, thanks everyone for joining us again tonight and stay cool. We'll see you soon.